I need a clicker. Thanks. Good morning, Pop Tech. How y'all doing? Good. So yeah, you know how the right brain is really sensual and creative and passionate and um, feels like the sand beneath your feet, walking on a shore, um, reading poetry and drinking wine, and the left brain is um, really a downer. Um, you know, really uh, always telling you to, you know, be realistic, um, that uh, you really need to um, be more logical and, uh, well, no. Um, the truth is a lot more nuanced um, than a lot of people portray the sort of uh, gross left brain, right brain distinction. What I want to talk about today is an emerging framework in cognitive neuroscience that suggests that creativity and, and human cognition more generally doesn't arise from a single bit of the brain or a single, um, solely from a single side of the brain, but, but the whole creative process from that first burst of inspiration to um, actually getting the job done um, and everything in between requires an interaction of lots of cognitive processes and emotions. And depending on what you're creating, the stimulus, the content, and what stage of the creative process you're in, different brain areas are recruited to help solve the task. And importantly, these brain areas work together as a team. So, um, in recent years, cognitive neuroscience has, um, has this new paradigm looking at large-scale brain networks, showing that human cognition is the result of a concerted effort of lots of different uh, uh, brain regions working together as team players. And as I hope to show you today, um, within this framework, um, creativity and the different processes of creativity make a lot more sense. Let me go through and let's take a little bit of a tour of some of the cognitive processes that, um, that uh, creativity researchers and cognitive neuroscientists have looked at. Let's start with imagination. I think we can all agree that imagination is pretty important for creativity. Um, if you uh, don't have an imagination, um, it's hard to um, create something that um, has not existed yet. So cognitive psychologists administer what are called divergent thinking tests to measure imagination. This is, this is the predominant paradigm in our field of creativity research. And this is an example of a kind of uh, divergent thinking item that you would see if you went into one of our laboratories and sat down and we measured your creativity. And in fact, I am going to measure your creativity right now. Um, um, not all of you, don't worry, don't have a panic attack. Um, but um, I would like to actually open it up. I want you to think to yourself, what would happen if people could become invisible at will? Okay, I want to get, you know, give you a couple seconds, think it through, think of some responses, then I'll show you some responses that are rated as highly creative. Um, but I'd love to hear some of your uh, thoughts on what would happen. Maybe some of you are invisible right now and you can uh, actually um, speak from a purpose, uh, per, a first person perspective, you can tell us. Um, yeah, let's, a uh, couple moments, think it through, let the associative network flow all over the place. Don't be shy. I know it's early. My immediate reaction was that I'd be able to fly. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were primed by some talks yesterday. <laughs> fly on a bicycle, perhaps? <laughs> More people would walk around naked. <laughs> it's true. I would expect that. <laughs> uh, no more lines? No more lines? Yeah, no more people queuing up. Oh, gotcha. I'm thinking like actor lines or something like that. I, you know, like, cool, cool. Um, let's just uh, maybe one more if we have it. Oh, um, I was just thinking oh, there would be a lot more robberies. Am I the only one that went to a really negative place with this exercise? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's probably exactly what would happen. Um, so. In these kinds of psychology experiments, you know, we bring people in the laboratory and we have them solve all these kinds of tasks, and then we get a panel of judges. Um, it's called the consensual assessment technique, pioneered by uh, Teresa Mobley. And you, and you find that people are actually strikingly um, congruent in what is really creative and what is not really creative. You find that the judge interjudge reliability is actually pretty high. I'm going to show you some responses. Um, these, are, uh, these are college students. Um, so I know some of them are sexual in nature, so I want to make that clear that these are college students giving these answers, not like two-year-olds. Um, um, these are some, uh, these are, <laughs> I, just, I feel like I should preface that. Okay, let me give you some responses. So um, here are some rich responses. Um, uh, very shy people would have sex while being invisible. 
Um, you see some similarities to some of the things you guys came up with. You could see only beautiful people on the beaches. <laughs> Cops would wear infrared goggles. Paparazzi would be more effective. Think about it from a paparazzi perspective. It's win-win. It's not win-win, but it's win. Um, it, would be <laughs> it would be harder to play hide and seek. You could escape a bad date. <laughs> so, these, so here's the question. From a neuroscience perspective, um, if we put you in an fMRI machine or put these people who have really creative responses in an fMRI machine, what is going on in their brains? What differentiates really imaginative people from not imaginative people? And to answer that question, I'm going to show you some uh, really crucial of these large-scale brain networks that I was talking about earlier. They're absolutely crucial and essential if we want to understand the neuroscience of creativity, at the very least, at the very minimum. One is called the, um, we can call it the attentional control network. Sometimes it's called the executive control control network, depending on which journal article you read, it's called something different. But the, the, the unifying theme of this network, it's your ability to concentrate. It's your ability to control your attention, manipulate things. Working memory is really important. So this, this uh, large scale brain network gets recruited when you're trying to men do analytic manipulation, you know, abstract reasoning, um, pay attention to someone else's goals. As a shorthand, we can call it the looking out network. Make things simple. This network is really important to pay attention to shit you really don't care about, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, looking out, okay? Am I allowed to curse at Pop Tech? Is that, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> if not, I don't know if there's gonna be like a beep beep sorry when I watch the video, like if I'm gonna be censored. Okay, um, the other major network we really need to uh, look at when we look at creativity is uh, what has been dubbed, um, it's, uh, I'm not a big fan of what it's been dubbed, it's called the default mode network. The reason why neuroscientists dub it the default mode network is because it is the brain network that is most active when we're at rest. When we're looking in, when our inner stream of consciousness, we're turning our attention to our inner stream of consciousness. You know, we're daydreaming. We're imagining the future. Something that's really interesting, and, and this is actually um, a revolution, I would say, in cognitive neuroscience. Um, some argue, like Kalina Kristoff argues, it's a paradigm shift in cognitive neuroscience. Um, because prior to maybe like 15, 20 years ago, cognitive neuroscientists were only interested in um, their own goals, right? So everything else, the inner stream of chatter, was disregarded as noise. But when cognitive scientists started asking, well, what, what is actually, um, is there any use to idle mind? And they found that there's a huge, about 50% of our human cognition is that inner stream of consciousness. And when our brain is most at rest and our mind wanders, where does it wander? It turns out it wanders about the future. Our brain constructs mental simulations. That is what this, this brain network does. It helps construct mental simulations of the future, as well as mental simulations of other minds. So this brain network is so important for social cognition, for reading, not literally reading the minds of others, but what's called theory of mind, simulating the minds of others, you know, mentally transporting your mind into another mind. All these things, compassion, reflective compassion, um, imagination, and remembering the past, because it turns out that when we remember, when we think about the future, we're recruiting brain structures in this network about our past. So all, always when we're thinking about the future, we're recruiting um, these deeply personal memories. So those are the two main brain networks that um, are going to be a recurring theme through today, the looking out network and the looking in network. Now this is what's particularly interesting about creative people. Ordinarily, in, um, in most people, in the population at large, these two brain networks are antagonistic with each other. So the more that we look, and this is intu should be intuitively obvious to you, right? The more that you um, are focusing in your inner stream of chatter, you're oblivious to things going on out, out there, right? That, exact, that attentional control network is suppressed. Also, the more that people demand our attention, the, they're, they're actually robbing us of that opportunity to imagine, right? So in schools where teachers are like 20, not 24 hours a day, no one goes to school for 24 hours a day, but for, um, uh, for uh, how long is school? Six hours, let's say six hours. Teachers are demanding your attention and they're robbing children of the opportunity to um, exercise this network. Well, it turns out that when you stick people, we're going to return out to that, um, what happens when you stick people in the fMRI MRI machine. Those who really are, are really, really creative, they show something that is a bit different than what every uh, ordinary person shows. They're able to simultaneously co-activate both of these networks at the same time. In fact, this uh, part, of, this part um, called the precuneus is, is a part of the default mode network that is most active when our brain is at rest. It's associated with self-reflection, self-representations. It's associated with self-reflection, self-consciousness. Um, um, uh, some people argue this is one of the most important brain regions for consciousness. 
And it turns out that creative people, or imaginative people, are always keeping this active, even while they're focusing on the external environment. So this is really interesting if you think about it. It suggests that, that people who are really imaginative, maybe why they're, they're able to make all these different connections that other people are not able to make is because they have this great openness to experience. They're always on, they're always, um, their filter is always down, right? They're always conscious of their inner stream of consciousness while they're simultaneously able to focus on the outside world. So they show a very, um, different pattern of the ability to simultaneously activate two large-scale brain networks that in most people are antagonistic to each other. I think that's really, really interesting. And something else that is interesting is that if you compare schizophrenic people versus creative people, you see no difference. No, that's not entirely true. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that and then say just joking. But it's a, there's actually a... <laughs> There's actually a very large grain of truth to what I just said, because there's something called schizotypy, which is like schizophrenia light. Um, it's a personality dimension. It's a personality dimension. Every single person in this room is somewhere on that bell curve of schizotypy. You find relatives of people with full-blown schizophrenia okay, have what's called schizotypy. And the thing with those who have schizotypy is that you do find when you put them in an MRI scanner and you, you have them solve divergent thinking tests, their brain activity does show this, this precuneous activation just as high as just creative people who um, you haven't even looked at their schizotypy. So there is a great overlap in this activation of the default mode network, that inner stream of consciousness. Now you can, you can see um, where that fine line between madness and genius is, right? Because those who have that, um, that executive functioning um, that don't have that attentional control, they're all they, that's why they're hallucinating. They're, they're having a lot of contagion from that inner stream of consciousness into the outside world, right? So they can't, they, you know. But let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater because imagination, they still are very, very imaginative. You meet people with schizophrenia, they're very, very imaginative. But what seems to be lacking is their ability to simultaneously activate these two brain networks that allow them to, to somehow rein in control um, and focus what they're imagining. So I think that's really interesting. So in fact, do we have any Edgar Allan Poe fans here? Okay, I can't actually see anything, so I'll just assume the whole, uh, the whole room raised their hand. I'll just assume that, because um, I'm a big Edgar Allan Poe, Poe fan. So here's a great quote. I think he had it right. I think he, you know, um, uh, my next book won't be titled Poe was a neuroscientist, but I do think that this, um, this quote um, really, I think he really got it quite right. He said, men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled, whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence, whether much that is glorious, whether all that is profound does not spring from disease of thought, from moods of mind, mind exalted at the expense of the gentle intellect. Those who dream by day, he's saying those who keep their precunious active, that's really what he's saying, are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night. In their gray visions, they obtain glimpses of eternity and thrill in waking to find that they have been on the verge of the great secret. secret. Quite poetic, right? I love it. Another cognitive process I want to talk about is flow. It's a really important process. And, and that is when um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi um, pioneered the whole study of flow. And what he found is that um, a lot of creative people in a lot of different fields um, have reported this state where their self-critic is, 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 is gone. Um, they're, they're one with what they're creating. Their level and expertise level is perfectly matched to what they're engaging in. And so they feel this effortless feeling of joy. They have no idea. I mean, have, have any of you like gone like six hours working on something and then you look at the time and you're like, WTF, that was six hours? You know, like, like, you're, like you're shocked that, that was six hours, you know? You were probably in a full state. So to look at um, this flow state, what some psychologists have done, um, primarily um, the great work of Charles Lim and his colleagues, they've stuck um, rappers and, uh, and, uh, and uh, improvisers, um, jazz improvisers in the FMR machine, say like, you know, do your thing, you know, you do your thing, um, you know, do, yeah, right, do your thing while there's a magnet, you know, strapped to your head, basically, you know, with a sound going, but um, to the best, the best you could do, do your thing, right? Um, <laughs> so. I, I fully admit that with all this stuff, it's not perfectly ecologically valid, but it is really interesting what they found. Because they found when comparing, they had them do improvised stuff and they had to do prepared stuff, and they looked at the brain activation differences between the two conditions. And what they found is, is simultaneous activations and deactivations in the full state. And I bet you can predict what it was, okay? So in the default mode network, it was very highly active. So their mind, that inner stream of consciousness, they were totally in that flow. 
And that attentional control network, now it was decoupled, okay? So at this point, it was decoupled, and, it was, and the activation was much, much lower. Not absent, but much, much lower relative to default mode network activation, um, particularly the medial prefrontal cortex of the default mode network was highly active. Um, so that's really interesting. That suggests that when you're in the flow state, your inner critic, which is coming from that attentional control network, particularly the dorsolateral uh, outside surface of the prefrontal cortex, which is just right here be, uh, behind my forehead, um, is silenced. So that inner critic is, 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 is silenced, not say, is not nagging you. It's not saying, oh, that was a bad idea, that was a good idea. No, these people who were in the flow state, as much as can be in an fMRI, fMRI scanner, really did um, show um, this interesting decoupling of the brain networks. So another thing I want to talk about is some interesting research on artistic skill. Um, and this doesn't come from normal, um, ordinary, uh, ordinary people, but it comes from a special population of folks with something called uh, frontotemporal dementia. So um, people, as they grow older, sometimes they get a particular form of dementia where their language functions um, get reduced, reduced, reduced. And the question is, is there a facilitation in other areas? And um, Bruce Miller has found in, that in various patients that later on in their life, they suddenly got a burst of interest in music and in art. Um, and they're like, where did this come from? You know? And it's unbelievable. Um, a really striking case of this is Ann Adams, who in her 50s became obsessed with, with art, obsessed with painting. Um, she was a scientist her whole life. And she particularly got obsessed with Ravel. And she converted one of the composer Ravel's piece into, um, this, um, into uh, the sensory representation, right? She, she, this is called multimodal art, right? She took and converted the music into art. And what's really interesting is during this period when she was getting this, this is actually the same exact age that Ravel had the same neurological condition, okay, and composed his music. She didn't know any of this, okay? She was just attracted to his repetition and structure. Okay, and, and literally, I think it's the same exact age, you know, like 53, that both of them um, got interested in this kind of work. And this is really interesting. What you see here is as her, her left hemisphere, particularly the frontal and uh, anterior uh, temporal lobe, started degenerating, the more it degenerated, the more her work shifted from more abstract, conceptual, multimodal representations to more realistic art. All the way by 2004, she was mute. So when she went into for that UCSF evaluation, her language functions were almost completely gone. She was, and she was mute. And um, she could barely talk, right? And this is what she still could paint, OK? It's beautiful. It's, it's really realistic. And Bruce Miller suggests that this left hemisphere um, aspects um, of this de degeneration um, actually freed up right hemisphere functions. Now, many of you are saying, yeah, but at the beginning of the talk, you said we need to get rid of this left brain, right brain stuff. But I think that what this adds is a lot more nuance to it. From a large scale brain network perspective, okay, the frontal and temporal lobes are, a team, are team players. And it suggests that when that large scale brain network is, is, um, is disrupted, like in the left hemisphere, um, that our brain has this amazing ability to reorganize itself. And it seems like right hemisphere functions, especially in the back, um, associated with sensory integration and things of that nature, come to the fore and allow us to access uh, more realistic representations. Um, and it's very conducive to art. And I've been studying savants, and you find striking congruence with, with these savants who um, have very um, low language functions. Many of them are autistic, or on, on the autistic spectrum, and yet they're able to do amazing, amazing things. So I just want to um, end here today um, with um, some uh, directions for the future. Uh, by the way, I'm showing this dog here because I think it's really important in the last stage of the creative process to remember that it's important not just to come up with ideas or that may be bizarre, but also to bring that executive network back online because sometimes if you don't bring that critical thinking back online, you can end up with something like this. But I'll leave it to you. I'll leave it to you to tell me whether or not you think this is valuable and useful. Okay, so I think it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time for the field of the neuroscience of creativity. Um, as long as we, out, we get rid of outdated notions or simplistic notions of how creativity works. I think in particular, we need to study more domains, more varied domains. Why not break dancing? Why not dance? Why don't we put all sorts of people in the fMRI scanner? Although I don't know how you can do ballet dancing in the fMRI scanner, but we need to look at more domains. We need to look at different species, right? I want to look and see at, you know, how does like um, a turtle paint versus like, no, not a turtle, but um, 
how does a chimpanzee paint, you know, versus human. I want to really look at lots of different cross species. And I felt like we also need to look at longer time scales, right? A lot of creative people really um, engage in things. For, they get obsessed with an issue, and their whole life they're obsessed with one issue, right? So I need to think we need longer time scales than just trying to capture this in one moment of time. And lastly, I think collaboration is immensely important. I think it's important to see how does collaboration affect the brains of everyone who's involved in creating. Thank you so much. Thank you.